Hey everyone, welcome to Fighting Over the Card Catalog, a snarky look back on young adult novels of the 80s and 90s. I'm Jess. I'm Steven, and I'm here to make my wife happy. We're taking a journey to find out how many terrible and hopefully some not so terrible books from my youth I can get my husband to read before he reconsiders this whole marriage. Hi. Hey, beautiful brown eyed baby. Oh, thank you. How are you? Uh, you know? <laughs> I don't know. You gotta tell me. Uh, I'm doing okay. Well, uh, hey, great how job. How about yourself? <laughs> um, I'm having a day. Yeah. Uh, not the best body day for me, but, uh, my headspace is pretty good considering that, so I'm good. <laughs> I've only heard you cry once since you got, <laughs> since I got home. Okay, well, I almost broke the toilet, so, I mean, it's a problem. <laughs> it's an upsetting problem, and it hurts. It physically hurts, it mentally hurts, it all hurts. Anyway, enough about my toilet problem. <laughs> it's not even technically a toilet problem, I guess, but anyway. Anyway, this week, we are <laughs> under the hawthorn tree. By Marita Conlon McKenna. Yeah, speaking of problems. <laughs> Yo, published in 1990. Tell us about it. Ireland in the 1840s is devastated by famine. When tragedy strikes, their family, Eli, Michael, and Peggy, are left to fend for themselves. Starving and in danger of being sent to the workhouse, they escape. Their only hope is to find the great aunts they have heard about in their mother's stories, but they barely know where they are but they barely know where they are or how to get there. Their journey marks the start of one of the great adventures in children's literature. True. So, on the scale of one being the best book ever to the Dementors gives a 10, sucking the soul from your love of reading. What do you give it? Um, So this one's probably, I would say, three and a half to four. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, not a bad book. Uh, It was... Um, you know, it didn't have total devastation. The, the characters <laughs> that you come to care about, um, you know, they, they survive. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, for the most part. Uh, <laughs> uh, better than some of the other people they pass and mm-hmm. happen, so. Uh, or in their family. <laughs> yeah, you know, so it has a positive, a kind of a positive outcome. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, knowing the time frame and the period, that's probably unlikely. <laughs> I mean, but, some people died. Yeah, <laughs> right? some, some people. people lived. Excuse me. Yeah, that's true. Some people who didn't migrate to America or mm-hmm. to England uh, mm-hmm. did survive. Oh, they didn't want them. That's why they were dying. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to have some saltiness about the English. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the English during this time of famine, um, they had literally had people running the government who said, there's not an issue here. They can just eat grass. And they actually put out like pamphlets telling people how to boil grass, field mm-hmm. grass to eat. Well, no, that, that didn't work. You, it, it didn't you work. actually got stomach cramps and threw up and diarrhea. Yeah, and it like made it worse. It made you do. die. It made you die faster. But these well, people just believed that there wasn't really an issue that they just didn't want to eat grass. So they were starving just because they didn't want to do what the English were telling them to do. Yeah, it's true. Fucking Irish. Yeah. Anyway, I give it a three. Um, yeah. See, for all my silly, bad books like Babysitters Club and shit. I loved, like, these, like, serious, dramatic books just as much. Like, stories like this and ones about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, Number of the Stars. We'll get to that one eventually. Oof. (laughs) But, yeah. So, I do have these in my background as well. They're just not as much fun to cover. Yeah. Yeah. More enjoyable to read. But... (laughs) You know, it's a snarky podcast, so it's not as, uh, it doesn't have the depth to snark on. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, so we meet the three main characters. Okay, I don't know how to say her name exactly. I see it as Eileen. I thought it was Eli, but I don't know. I'll, I look, don't up, know. I'll look up a pronunciation and see All what right. it tells. I'm just going to call her Eileen for now because that's what I had in my head. Okay. Eileen is 12, Michael is 9, and Peggy is 7. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Theo Driscoll's in 1845. When the famine is becoming hella widespread due to the failure of the potato crop, they live in Dunneen, Dunneen, probably Dunneen, in Southwest Ireland. Okay, I know we have at least one listener in Ireland. Please feel free to correct me on any of these pronunciations. I am only a lowly Irish American, so I don't really know. The pronunciation is I Lee. Okay. You I like Lee. like I right and Lee. I think that's what I was saying. I Lee. I might have been saying it faster, but anyway, okay. So their parents, Margaret and John, have a small plot of land, but yeah, the potatoes are destroyed by the blight, like everyone else's. Um, I Lee recalls a day at school, um, when a boy like rushed in to get his brother and tells everyone that. You need to rush home because there's been a blight and the potatoes are all rotting. And Eile is surprised that the schoolmaster allows it and actually, you know, like, is for it. He's like, yeah, y'all, get home. Do what you can. Uh, But when they do got, when they do got home. (laughs) When they do got home. (laughs) When they (laughs) do get home, like, the stench of the rotten potatoes was just overwhelming as their parents were pulling them out of the ground. So, John has gone to seek work on a government relief scheme working on the roads. Just just so people know, like, mm-hmm. they would grow other crops, um, but the main calorie and, I guess, uh, you would call, like, um, filler that they yeah. used were potatoes. Right. Like, um, you know, everything was basically to flavor the potato mm-hmm. or to be added to the potato. Right. And um, so, yeah, that was their main sustenance. And when this blight came and spread. They are fucked. Yeah, they were kind of fucked. And it it lasted for five years where there Mm -hmm. were five years in a row where they had Mm -hmm. this blight. Um, In two of the years, uh, more than a million people in Ireland died of famine. That yeah, at the it's time, surprising anybody. That at the time lived. was a was a large portion of the population. Yeah, I know. I read what the overall population was, but I did you? Yeah. Um. So John has left the rest of the family at home with their dwindling food supplies. Plus, little bitty baby Bridget is very ill. The sisters go to visit Mary Kate, a wise woman with healing powers, possibly a witch, it's fine, uh, to go get uh, goose grease to rub on Bridget's chest. And she also gives them the great treat of an apple because Mary Kate is wonderful. And the next day, the kids are all like hella excited because their neighbor, Pat Connolly, is taking them to the bog further than they... uh, they've ever been where there is more turf to be collected so that's a big deal because the peat is used as a source of fuel like better or more plentiful than yeah there was wood and yeah there wasn't a whole lot of of um like wooded right. areas and again all of the all of the land was owned by the english oh yeah and so when there was a forest it was owned by an englishman right. and all the the sticks and trees in it and all of the animals that were in right. the those forests were owned by uh and if you were caught taking even limbs that had fallen from the trees uh that would be considered theft right so most people most of the poorer people in Ireland would use the peat which was basically just um I think it was uh, grass and other things that had it decayed is, over time. Yeah, 
The accumulation of decayed vegetation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there were 8.4 million people before the start of the famine. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so an interesting thing uh, about Pete when I was looking up, it up um, is it did help regulate the climate by removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing carbon within the peat. Um, but as fuel, it's more damaging than coal. Yeah. Um, because it generates less energy when burned while producing higher carbon emissions. So in 2018, gotcha. uh, they closed the remaining peat bogs mm-hmm. in Ireland uh, to fight climate change. Though environmentalists are like, it's too little, too late. Yeah. Well, good, good job. <laughs> yeah. I'm assuming we're not still digging coal out of the ground. Many mm-hmm. people need it for fuel, but I don't know actually. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what they and use. Since we're still dependent on yeah. coal, I don't know what they do. Anyway, this is obviously not their main concern right then. Mm. So they have a rough, tiring day, but they do come back with some fuel. So huzzah. Just not as much as they're used to, but it's fine. Um, But that night, little Bridget passes away. And it is fucking sad, (laughs) y'all. In the morning, they send Michael to go get Pat. To go get Father Doyle while the others prepare prepare Bridget for burial. However, only Pat and his wife Kelly show up with the news that the priest and the coffin maker have come down with the fever. So there are no funerals. (laughs) So they decide to bury Bridget under the hawthorn tree in their grandmother's chest. Now I'm assuming they're Catholic, right? Yeah. So... Isn't there something about them being buried in consecrated ground? Uh, I don't know if that was so much matter back then. I don't actually know. I mean, now, yes. And in healthy times. Well, I mean... I would have assumed you know, it would if have been at that the, time as well. If yeah, but the, I mean, in the sick times, I mean, yeah. you know. Right, because basically so many people were dying, they had to build... They had to dig mass graves and yeah, probably yeah. yeah. So, mother, uh, once she's feeling a bit better after this horrible grief, uh, goes to the village to exchange a dress and a shawl for some food. And while she's gone, an old woman and her son call to the house looking for food, but Michael's like. Oh, thank goodness you've come. We're so very sick. Cough, cough from behind yeah. the door without opening it. And they're all like, okay, Please, peace out. Please, get us some water. <laughs> My sister died of fever two days. Oh, that was not a joke. That was real. That was <laughs> real. <laughs> uh, and everyone's real, real proud of him for his quick thinking. Yeah, and he's supposed to be nine, uh-huh. right? And Eileen is 12. Yeah. and. Penny is, and Peggy. Peggy is seven, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so mother comes back that the with the news that the devi- the village is just devastated by famine and houses are boarded up and whole families have died or have immigrated and everyone there is starving. So she learns that the road works though, are about 20 miles away, and she hopes that John will be there. So she's returned with the food, and they have good old stories about her olden times, because apparently she was, I don't know if they were rich, but, you know, they were just normal in her childhood, and they had, like, folk. cakes, and, <laughs> yeah. Um. So shortly afterwards, Mother decides to leave in search of her husband. And Peggy throws a fucking fit, uh, but Eileen calls calms her down with a story about their great aunt in Castle Taggart, and how they both got fucked over by the same man when they were young, mm. and decided to swear off men forever and open a store together, like a pastry shop, I guess. With, At the so. in the end, it sounds like it's uh, like a jam and jelly shop. Yeah. Anyway, hell yeah, ladies, rock on. I love you. <laughs> um, so 
Mother's been gone for a few days when the landlord's agent, Jer Simmons, and his assistant, Tom Daly, show up and tell the children that they're going to have to go to the workhouse as they have no means of support. And they're kind of like, well, you know, mom and dad are probably dead. So <laughs> um, let's go to Castle Taggart in search of the great ants. And they tell uh, Pat, was that the neighbor's name? Mm. Yes. Uh, they let him know that that's where they're going in case their mom and dad come back. Uh, they can find them there. Uh, so Tom arrives the next day with a bunch of other people from their village who don't have a man around to make money. And so the kids go along, but intending to escape. So, yeah, I did wonder, like, did Jer or the landlord receive money from the workhouse or something from each person? Mm. But what happened was this was all because of the Irish Poor Act of 1838, uh, largely based on the English Poor Act of mm. 1834. Uh, the ultimate goal of the poor law was to stimulate economic development by pressuring the Irish landlords to consolidate their holdings, leading to an investment of capital in Ireland. So that made the landlords responsible for the relief of the poor on the smallest properties. Um, and so that's what gave the landlords a strong incentive to rid themselves of mm. the poor ass tenants. Um, who are in that category and not able to pay rent. Um, and so they did that by evicting them or by paying the tenants to immigrate on the coffin ships because mm. really not a ton of them made it to Canada or America because they just died on the ships. So. Well, a lot of them were also already malnourished and well, sick right. or poor right. when they got on the boat. So then you've got a, I don't know, three three month journey. Yes. Across and, you know, if you like the cruise ships of today, if you're stuck, yeah, all you're, together on a ship yeah. and somebody's got coronavirus, it's yeah, gonna be except, bad. Except when you were in the poor lower decks, you were all stuffed into one room. It was not right. Or, you well, know, yeah. one hold. It wasn't, you didn't even get your separate rooms. Mm -hmm. You know, so one person got Obviously. sick, everybody got sick. Right. So, the kids go with the group for a day or so, and then they jump over a wall and run off. Uh, Tom notices, though, and sends some other people after them. However... In their flight, they've basically doubled back, and all of a sudden, old Mary Kate is there to cover for them, saying, "Oh, I'm looking for my goat," and makes a whole bunch of noise. And <laughs> since the guy's on their way, they were talking about when they were running away, how they, um, they hid like under some brambles and stuff, mm -hmm. and and how they had all these cuts and stuff on on themselves that they didn't realize at the time. Yeah, and I've actually, actually like stuck in. I've stuck actually into done them. that running away from people yeah. before. I just went through like thorns or whatever. And at the time your drilling's going so fast you don't realize. Oh yeah. But if you lay there for like a and, few hours, yeah. you start feeling. And then you get out of the situation, your heart rate starts going back, and then you've got all these cuts and mm -hmm. bruises all over the place. But they stayed there and stayed quiet. And then Mary Kate uh brings them in for the night and gives them food and medicines for them to take um and she actually wants them to stay but eileen's like nah this bitch can't spare anything she yeah i'd love to but yeah there's a little house it's like a one-room house mm -hmm. and yeah but no she's got a good dog and in. goat for company at yeah. least, so. <laughs> for the time being i know we don't need to talk about it uh Shit gets upsetting enough with animals later, okay? <laughs> yeah, it's like every time I see an animal, this a book, I'm like, oh, there's some food. Yeah, I know. <laughs> she's like, at one point, she's holding a bird, and I'm like, well, why, why are you just holding that bird? <laughs> Get that bird. I mean, it's a tiny bird. It'll barely <laughs> feed Peggy. It's some calories. Yeah. Well, apparently, they get their calories later. Anyway. So they start their journey off by themselves, and Michael ends up cutting his leg on a rock. 
and it becomes hella infected. So Eileen makes him stop and rest for a day and uses one of Mary Kate's medicines and ointment on his wound. But it's not enough. It, uh, you know, it's gone on too long. So she ends up cleaning a knife in boiling water and then slashes the wound open. And she puts some fabric in the water and ties it around the gash. And she changed the dressing three times. And the third time, the cloth was stained yellow and green where the pus was draining away. Delightful. <laughs> but it worked. It's better the next day. But they're like... Yeah, he probably needs to rest for another day. So all you kids, keep that in mind. If there's an infected wound, just cut it open with just a Just cut it open, no problem. And then, and then, you know, bind it and, you know, change it a few times. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yep. Yep, no problem. So, um, Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Come on, kids. Oh, my God. So while Michael is resting, uh, Eileen finds some strawberries and Peggy finds a dead rabbit. But Eileen will not let them eat it because Mary Kate had advised them to never eat already dead animals uh, because she's a smart lady. But the next day, um, they figure, well, if there's one rabbit, there's probably more. And so, yeah, they see a whole bunch, and Michael kills another rabbit with just a fucking stone to the head. Like, he just mm-hmm. he just threw it and hit it in the head. It's like, damn. Uh, Peggy's pretty upset at seeing the poor little thing die, but does end up eating it anyway. So they travel for another few days, um, seeing just, like, all sorts of poor, wretched people along the road, um, but staying away from them in case of the fever. And they meet up with a boy named Joseph, uh, who tells them, hey, there's a soup kitchen set up nearby with some, by some weird religious people. Um, when they get there, they see just all these horrible, starving people, and Eileen decides that this must be what hell looks like. And it takes them nearly all day to reach the front of the line, but finally get a cup of soup each. And then during the night, an old man shook them and told them they better be on their way as the heathens would try to convert them in the morning. And if they took another mug of soup, they may as well take the queen's shilling. Children were puzzled, but simply ignored him. But, yup, the next day while they're in line, uh, there are these people roaming about talking with kids and then leading them into a building and it sounds creepy as fuck. You know what the taking the shilling was in reference to? Taking the queen's money? It was basically um, you would get a shilling to um, join the navy or the oh, army. And got it. So they would have press gangs go in to basically go into all the L houses and find people who are destitute mm. and very drunk. And get them. Sometimes they would literally take a drunk person, <laughs> press it into their hand, and as long as they close their hand, that was like a contract. That was a contract that they would have to. They would then take them to <laughs> wherever they were holding the people before they marched them to where they were going to join service. But cool. it was basically joining the English yeah. military. At that. So it was basically joining the Protestants. Then in the Church of England, I'm guessing in this case. Mm. Yeah, maybe. Probably. They're heathens. Yeah. Um, um, so our kids get spoken to, but they say like this random couple are their parents and I, I'm I'm just thinking back on that. I wonder if um the people like that were then the the children were then like taken back to England or something. Put up for adoption. And put up for adoption, uh, given away to other people or given to work houses. Yeah, I was wondering England. what their whole yeah. hmm. scheme there was. Yeah. Nothing good, I'm certain, but. I mean, if you survive, you survive, but, you know, it doesn't mean you're not going to survive as a slave. All right. Uh, so anyways, the kids get the hell out of there after they get one more cup of soup. And split up with Joseph. He wasn't around very long. Um, Then the girls find a dead body. And it's pretty fucking upsetting, obviously. Uh, They say a prayer for him, though. But 
a bit later, they all kind of have a bit of a breakdown, uh, basically worrying about their own mortality. Uh, but then they realize they're still alive and they all look pretty silly, you know, with big old tear stained red faces and shit. Uh, and they have a bit of a laugh, but the crying did them some good, you know, releasing some tension. A catharsis. Yeah. So, after that, things look up for a little bit. They come across people digging up a whole bunch of turnips as the farmer had just died. And so they're able to fill up their food bag. And then they find a lake and have a wash. And Michael catches some fish. And they figure out how to light a fire. Because apparently they did not know before this, which is kind of yikes. Um, but then it all turns to hell in the next chapter. A group of wild, crazed-looking dogs find them, and one attacks Peggy, getting a hold of her arm and shaking it, not letting it go like like it would like a small creature to break its neck or something. And it's really pretty horrific. And finally, a Michael is able to kill the dog with a really large limb hitting it over its head, and he feels terrible, I feel terrible. Uh, but Eileen tells him it's, you know, probably better for the dog to be out of its misery. And she's probably right. So I let this one go. And she puts some of Mary Kate's ointment on Peggy's arm, bandages up, and off they go again. And then the, where they arrive at the seaside town of Bally Carberry. Um... Which, by the way, Dunin and Bally Carberry are real towns. So, you know, obviously I had to look up the walking time mm -hmm. on Google. And it's about 30 hours. Okay. That's a fair bit for a seven-year-old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, Bally Carberry, uh, everything, everything seems pretty normal and prosperous. Um, but... A crowd of poor travelers form around the kids, and they all make their way down to the harbor, where they see just sacks and sacks of grain being loaded onto ships, headed for England. And this rightly upsets the crowd a bit, and some boys rip open some sacks of the grain, and our kids manage to get some grain, but then they get the hell out of town, probably right before a riot breaks out. They ask a farmer for directions, and he tells them they're on the right way. Um, and then he also gives them some bread and cheese, and they wonder if their luck is turning up. So, you know shit's about to go down. It's been summer this whole time, and now they can't find any water except the ocean, which fortunately they know not to drink, at least. They eat some blackberries and chew on some of that grass for some moisture. Uh, then they come across like this whole big burnt terrain. And Bridget, I mean, uh, Bridget, she's dead. <laughs> Penny asks if this is hell. And then they finally find some dirty ditch watcher. watcher. Mm -hmm. And then Michael points out. You say that like Mora. What? Some dirty ditch water. <laughs> <laughs> For the pepe. <laughs> For the pepes. Anyway, Michael points out that, oh, hey, we should be walking at night, you know, when it's cooler. Eileen <sighs> feels pretty stupid, as well she should. And a thunderstorm arrives, and it's pretty scary to be out in, but it obviously turns out to be a good thing. And then Peggy gets hella cranky all of a sudden, and whoops, she's got a big old fever, complete with delirium. This may be from the dog bite, but they can't be sure. I was worried she had rabies, um, but mm. it doesn't seem so. So they set up camp under a hawthorn tree, which doesn't sound ominous at all, kids. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, so Eileen starts to wonder if they shouldn't have just gone to the workhouse after all. You know, at least uh, Peggy probably wouldn't be sick and they'd be getting at least a full meal a day. Uh, so she decides to send Michael off to see if there's one nearby. 
he comes across a cottage on the way, and the old dude inside uh, pulls Michael's own trick, being quiet and pretending like no one's home until Michael assures him that, I just want directions. And so he's like, oh, okay, (laughs) and gives it to him. And when he arrives, it's a fucking nightmare. Uh, Yeah, first he gets there, and he's about to walk across the bridge that they told him to go across. And there's two people just laying in the middle of the road. It doesn't say if they're dead or alive. Just laying in the middle of the road. And then he goes over and sees all these people trying to get into the workout. Yeah, and there's like this huge stink before he even gets there. smell and people screaming and crying. Yeah, tons of starving people. And a lady comes out to announce that they're all full. Uh, There might be space. It might open up as Come people back die off. If people die, then. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Uh, Michael gets the hell out of there. Um, and it's, he says something like, "He's not even sure there is a god now, and if he is there, if there is, he's a monster." I'm like, yeah, Michael. Anyway, back at camp, uh, Peggy. Turns freezing, and but I guess it breaks her fever, and she's still like basically unconscious, but feeling better to the touch. And Michael runs in, telling Eileen to come quick because he's found a cow all stuck in some brambles, and he has decided to let some of her blood and catch it in a pail, and they get that whole bucket full and bring it back to camp. Had, had well, they ever, let the they, they they fix up the cow. Had you ever then, heard of that before? No. So there was a I've watched documentaries of um, tribes in Africa, uh, and they'll let their kids go out and watch their cattle, hmm. like really far away from from the um, from the village. Mm-hmm. And basically, they're meant to fend for themselves. But what they do is they bleed cattle like that where they'll Mm -hmm. they'll cut them it'll stream out they'll uh it actually showed them taking turns like pinching it and then coming over and letting it out like a water faucet and that's how they just into their mouth just straight into their mouth and that's how they would get uh their calories and nutrition yeah and and, uh it was it, it they have a very symbiotic um uh relationship where the cattle depend on them to protect them from mm. predators and um they get milk and blood and meat mm-hmm. from the cattle. Yeah. Sure. But yes, yeah, so that's a that's an actual thing. Oh, I assumed it was. Yeah. I just hadn't heard of it other than this and, book. And some people do it not out of emergency. Necessity. Not yeah. out of emergency, but that's just how their society yeah. survives. Yeah. Well, I guess it is necessity, but well, not yeah. emergency. Right. Anyway, they patch her up with some mud and whatnot and set her free and bring all the blood back to their camp and where they mix it up with some grain and some corn husks and make a blood and grain cake. It sounds delicious. Peggy wakes up. And they all feel better after their yummy cake. And she doesn't understand why they're making such a big deal out of her. Because she doesn't remember any of her illness. But she'll take it. And so after a few days, they decide to carry on. And along the way, they find rich people hoarding all their wealth. You know, some things never change. Uh, (laughs) Through a crack in a big, huge wall, they can see apples and berries growing, and Peggy finds a crack, a crumbling bit, just big enough for her to get through. So she goes in, she gets a bunch of strawberries and apples, and uh, and she basically finds a fucking paradise on the other side that she can't stay in. She's like, there's a pretty white bench, and it sounds like there's a fountain in there, and uh, it's disgusting. So they finally make their way to Castle Taggart, and yet again, it's a town that's completely functioning like normal. Um, so it's just you know the poor Mostly people like normal, out on yeah. the land that suffered. 
so the next day they find a bakery, uh, but the woman working there is obviously not one of their aunts. And so she shoes these ratty kids away, but it does tell them there's an old shop down the street that used to be run by two old ladies. So they go in there and find just a dusty, rundown place with some jam and stuff on the wall. And there, an old lady comes out uh, and she's like, I have nothing for you poor things. But Eileen calls her Aunt Lena and tells her who they are. And she softens and brings them into the kitchen for some soda bread and jam, which sounds delicious. Um, Aunt Nano is stuck up in bed, but she starts banging on the floor. And when Lena doesn't come up, uh, she comes down and she's like, oh, hell no. But Lena tells them who, tells her who they are. And she comes to get a good look at them. And under all the dirt and grime, she can see the family resemblance. So, so they let the kids, uh, finish eating and then tells, they tell them their whole story. About the journey they've been on. And they're like, well, we don't have much to offer you. But we always have room for a family. Aw. So they're finally safe and sound. But they will always remember their home. And the Hawthorne tree. The end. So I didn't know uh, that this was a trilogy. The second book, like, follows Michael, and the third one, Peggy. So, I wouldn't mind reading those. Not necessarily for the podcast, but just see what happens. Because, yeah. What was your favorite part? Um, the part where Peggy gets attacked by the dog. Are you serious? <laughs> no. Boy. No, I don't know. There's, I don't, I guess at the end when they meet their aunt and uncle and i mean the aunt and aunt mm -hmm. and they actually have food for them <laughs> i like how they call every living body a sinner mm. like you walked for over an hour and a half without oh, yeah. seeing a sinner i mean like i get it you know yeah, see when i heard that the first time i thought they were talking about just kids in particular because they said they it was immediately followed by something like about not having any kids anywhere. Oh. But anyway, yeah, I guess you're right. That yeah, no, just everyone's a anyway. sinner. Yeah. So, yeah. It's just another word for person. And I don't know. It makes me laugh. Uh, do you have a least favorite bit? Least favorite bit. Oh, the death. The least favorite <laughs> starving. bit is when they ha actually ran across animals and then didn't eat them. <laughs> ah. So do you not agree with Mary Kate that you shouldn't just eat random dead animals? Oh, not mind? about dead dead animals. Oh, okay. No, but there right. were there were more than one. It was more than just the bird too. There was another right. animal that they had come across and and then just you know didn't do anything. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you guys are letting calories go. Right. Do you think they should have eaten the dog? Um. Yes. What if it was rabid? Though? That that's the one I was thinking of. It actually killed an animal. Right. Um, well, I mean, I think you could tell if it was rabid, right? I mean, they said they look crazed. And I mean, that could mean. But I think that was just from things. hunger and. Right. But yeah. you know, if they're starving and shit, who knows what they could have picked up? Yeah. You know. Should they have killed the cow? Um, no, because there's really not any way of. I think they did the right thing with the cow. Okay. First of all, there's no way for them to actually like process it right properly. Yeah. I mean, they could take a chunk of meat with them, maybe, and that would be it. And mm -hmm. then the rest of the cow, you know, it would basically be it'd be wasted. like on Red Dead Redemption, where you only and, take a little bit and leave all that. <laughs> yeah. And then they would have had somebody would have been missing the cow. Right. That's what I was looking thinking. For it, and then that would, would be like big time theft. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I wish there had been more actual dialogue. Mm -hmm. Like, I guess it makes sense for a children's novel because it like speeds it up yeah. a bit. Um, but it keeps you at a certain distance from the characters. 
Um, and then that got me thinking, like, you know, I guess just because it's a third person point of view. Um, and then I wondered, do you have a preference as to first and third person? Um, no, I wouldn't say I have a preference. Really? That, that I'm aware of, hmm. that I'm conscious of. Hmm. I mean, I think I definitely prefer first, because I'd prefer to be, like, in the head of a character. Hmm. Um, but then I think the argument for that is... You know, you only get their perspective. Right. Except in Babysitter's Club, but (laughs) where you go off on a sitting job with a totally different person. Right. But because they've written it up in the notebook and they discuss it, (laughs) you learn everything. (laughs) Well, I guess guess I've read a lot of books in the past, too, where it was first person and, like, they would switch between chapters which first person you were following. Mm -hmm. They would. They would do that a lot. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, a lot of books. Yeah. I liked it when they would have that, and then it would be like two-thirds of the way through the book that then the, they would finally interact with each other, the people that you've that yeah. you've been hearing the first person from completely separately have come together yeah. for yeah. some something. I think I typically enjoy those, but I have seen them done very badly, and it's very frustrating. Uh I can't think of any examples right now, so good job. But <laughs> all right, so anything else on this book? Don't be poor. Don't be and poor. Irish. Don't be Irish. Just kidding. Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> hey, kids, do you love fighting over the card catalog? Totally. Now you can find your favorite podcast all over the world wide web. Look for us on Facebook. Instagram, Tumblr, YouTube, and Pinterest at Fighting Over the Card Catalog or on Twitter at Card Catalog Pod. And as a special bonus, head over to our very own website, FightingOverTheCardCatalog.com. And now you can get the inside scoop on co host Jess on Instagram and Twitter at Jess Digress. Whoa! Next, you can become a junior cataloger just by sharing us with your friends and rating and subscribing on Apple Podcasts. Whoa! Available wherever podcasts are sold. Podcasts not actually sold, but available in all podcatchers for free. Junior catalogers under the age of 18, ask your parent or guardian's permission before downloading. Welcome to the No Snark Zone. So, yeah, I thought we'd go lighter and happy and a bit silly comparatively to our past No Snark Zones because everything is terrible. Yeah. Uh, and you all know it. We don't need to. Yeah. So, yeah, there was uh, there were two cases of coronavirus <laughs> in Frisco yesterday. Actually, it turned out to just be one. OK. Um, I read it as a separate, but it. Turns out, no, this guy's kid goes to that elementary school. But anyways, yes, we have a case of coronavirus next town over where we are going tomorrow night to go see a huge ass soccer game. So (laughs) it's fine if you don't hear from us next week. (laughs) But other than that. Other than that, we went somewhere that was very on top as as top I, on top as you can be i wasn't that stoked to go i guess because it was a um a it was a teen yeah the north book. texas teen book festival yeah so anyway you know there were there were some authors there that i've i've read yeah um, there were like seven or eight yeah and you know wasn't completely stoked but you know anything to make my wife happy <laughs> Um, and it was very good. We sat in on some, on three or four panels. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, I want to go through them all. And they were all, uh, interesting. So good. And, uh, had good time. So, I, you know, I'll do it again mm-hmm. in the future. Just, <laughs> just, if nothing else, just to go to the panels and listen to yeah. other people talking in the I stories. Mean, it's basically like a young adult book con, basically. Um, 
Just not many people dressed up, but there were some Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, there were there were some cosplay people. Yeah, mainly just hella cool t-shirts. Good job, everyone. Um, but anyways, at first, I mean, it was just so overwhelmingly delightful to see so many baby book nerds just there and like nerding out when we were standing in line. You know, they were discussing, you know, like I read this many books and, you know, other people are like, what? And I'm like, yeah. And just. Oh, they are all so nerdy. And while we were in line to check out, which was a very long line, um, there were so many kids with the Babysitter's Club graphic novels that mm. I just about died. It made my heart so happy. Uh, so our first panel, uh, I forget what it was called, uh, but it was a lot of fun. And we got to see Stuart Something Gibbs. about Killer, the killer. Stuart Gibbs was part of that panel. Um, You've heard his name a lot if you've been listening to our show for a while, because he was the he is the author of the Spy School series that Stephen has talked a lot about. Because you've read like what seven of them? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And then uh, as as he was up in the panel, you know, just said, "Does he narrate his own books?" And uh, you know, I realized it afterward. Yeah, that's his voice. Yeah, because I'd heard you know just bits and pieces in the car or whatever, and I'm like. Yeah, because he's got a very distinctive voice, though. Uh, and we found at least one new title um, of a book from another author on that panel. Um, and then we went, our second panel was about making graphic novels, and we got to see Raina Telgemeier, who did the first four Babysitter's Club graphic novels, which who brought actually, them back into, you know. She, she actually came out of the bathroom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I was waiting. <laughs> And the person in front of me that was waiting, um, like, actually stopped her and had her take pictures with their daughter. And I'm like, just hurry up. I need to go to the bathroom. The panel's about to start. Well, she was on the panel. Yeah. Yeah, I had had no idea who she was. Yeah. Yeah. That's awkward. But uh, (laughs) she was just as delightful as you would hope she would be. Um, She kind of moderated the panel better than the actual moderator. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. Um, But the whole thing was really interesting. Uh, It was mainly about how a graphic novel gets made and the different ways these three authors uh, go about their processes and, you know, similar ways too. Um, And we also picked up a signed copy of the Christie's Great Idea graphic novel. And after lunch, we decided to go into a random panel because the panel after that was when I really wanted to go to. And it was pretty difficult to get into some panels if you weren't there super duper early. Um, yeah, like we, like we get, didn't get into our first one we, we wanted. Yeah, we were there 15 minutes early and it mm-hmm. was already full. Yeah. And that was one of the large rooms. And then so Maureen Johnson was mm-hmm. going to be at the panel and it was in a small room. So we're like, well, maybe yeah. we can just go into the panel before and stay yeah, there. So we just skipped. I'm really glad we went into this one. Oh my God. Um, it was about writing together in a pair um, with an, you know, with another author and they were Becky Albertalli, um, who write, who wrote uh, Simon and the Homo Sapiens Agenda. And, Aisha Saeed, and they wrote Yes, No, Maybe So together, and Kimberly Jones and Geely Siegel, who wrote I'm Not Dying With You Tonight together. Um, So it turned out to probably be my favorite panel of the day, honestly. Um, It was super diverse. Um, Becky and Julie are Jewish, and Aisha is Muslim, and Kimberly's black, and both their books reflect this. Um, God. They both just sound hella amazing. Yes, no, maybe so. It's like a meet cute about two teens who meet while canvassing uh, for an election. And I'm Not Dying With You Tonight is about two girls who get stuck on a bus together behind a riot, basically. And that's uh, basically based on a true thing that happened in Baltimore. Uh, Anyway, so the authors talk a lot about how they put themselves into the story and also how they dealt with like any disagreements or anything and Kimberly and Gilly um, particularly talked about how you know this was like a really difficult subject and they made a rule at the beginning of their process that 
you know, there would be no political correctness um, that they were going to have these hard conversations. They gave themselves a, a, a safe word. Yeah. And they said the safe word was basically meant to warn the other person that what they're about to say was not meant to be hurtful right. or, to, or to, you know, anything like that. But it was something that they needed to talk about. Yeah. And, you know, this is going to be rough, but it's something we need to get out there and figure out how to make it work. Um, and I think both pairs would, like, take a break for a while and come back to it. Um, Anyway, these both sound just like totally amazing, and I'm absolutely going to read them. Um, and I'm going to get our lo- library to o- order. I'm not dying with you tonight because they do not have that one. But um, so then came the question and answer period, and God, this one little boy, y'all. Oh my God, he was probably about ten. Um. So Kimberly had talked a lot about uh, growing up in the hood and putting that in the book and all. Um, Yeah, she talked a lot about um, because she run she ran a bookstore. She yeah, I don't know if she owns it or she just ran it. I think she ran it. Um, And apparently, a lot of people know it there in in Georgia and um, Atlanta. And she would order books for girls. And give them like thirty dollars in books for free mm-hmm. uh, at the end of the year, so they would have something to read over the summer. Right. And then she would ask them about the book afterwards, and a lot of the girls would say, "Well, I just couldn't get into it. I didn't, I didn't finish it." So, mm-hmm. um, so she started talking with them and asking them, you know, what books uh, do you want? Yeah, go online and, and find some books and, and I bring them. Order to me. them, and yeah. then you know. And she said that basically from doing this, that she 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 found out that um, girls just wanted, you know, she was dealing with go- girls from the hood and she wanted uh, they they wanted books that were in their voice that mm-hmm. that uh, represented them and were still, you know, strong, valid uh, heroes in mm-hmm. the book and not just um, people who were victims or. Uh, right. You know, something like that. And so that's kind of the motivation she had when they decided to mm-hmm. write this book. And when we say hood, by the way, that is her phrasing. It's not mm-hmm. our uh, it's not white our, what, yeah. <laughs> uh, view on it. Um, just using the language that she used. Um, so anyway, this little boy, um, he asked her if when she was growing up in the hood, if women had rights there. and just this kid just about he broke us um and all the authors but particularly kimberly of course and i mean she had to take a moment (laughs) um because she started tearing up i was tearing up um probably all the other adults in the room um i wanted to hug this child uh and you wanted to shake his hand i wanted to give him a high five (laughs) yeah yeah um but a it would be weird plus you know coronavirus (laughs) Uh, so yeah, that was, that was the best panel. Um, yeah. Uh, but that was another thing about the festival. Uh, they were super cautious about everything <laughs> coronavirus wise. Uh, they were like, they put out tweets beforehand and they reiterated throughout the day that like, we're not going to hug or shake hands or touch authors or anything during the signings. And they had Santa. Yeah, don't hand- go behind the tables right. for the signings, you know, give a, uh, you could still take a selfie. Just don't. Yeah, to stay there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they had hand sanitizer everywhere. And like, that's probably the most sanitizer any of us are going to see in one spot yeah. <laughs> for a very long time yeah. now. Um, cause I'm sure you're all, uh, sold out as well. So anyway, the last panel, um, well, let me make sure this is okay. Hold on. Yeah. Uh, the last panel was, uh, I finally got to see one of my very favorite authors and people in the whole world, Maureen Johnson. I've talked a lot about her before as an author and a co-host of Says Who Podcast. Um, her latest series is a mystery story, and this whole panel was about mysteries 
and murders and all sorts of fun stuff like that. Um, and it was another really diverse panel, which was cool. Um, and yeah, it was just a lot of fun, uh, talking about the dark shit like that. Although Maureen said, you know, I really don't think this is dark. <laughs> Uh, and then it was time for all the authors signings. Yeah, they were like, we deal with we deal with dark subjects, but the book itself is pretty lighthearted. Right. Yeah. Like most of them keep it like, you know, the stuff around it. Uh, getting in line for the signings was a bit of a clusterfuck. <sighs> but we got through it and, you know, then it really wasn't that terrible. Yeah, once they it had got us going. all line up outside and then they were having us go out on this gravel. Well, you know what? We're in a wheelchair. Yeah. Uh, and so first, um, ladies said, you know, they'd hold our place in line. Uh, you know, when they got up to us, they'd let us back in. Um, but then these two very lovely girls, uh, just let us get in in front of them. And it was so nice. And that was another thing about this, um, whole thing. Most people were like really super great. They um, still did the thing where they would cut across. Mm-hmm. But not as much as other places. And again, it's not a conscious thing. It's just something no. that when we're in groups, I think it's that it's mm-hmm. just a, a group mentality. But most of the people, when they realized they were doing it, would stop themselves yeah. and say, oh, please go in front of me. Yeah, they were really polite. And this, when we were standing in line for food, um, this little girl uh, crossed in front of me to go get some you know, boiled peanuts or something <laughs> on the other side of me. And she kind of stepped over my feet a bit. But, you know, like we were we were just sitting there in line. So I didn't think anything of it. But when she got back to her mom on the other side of me, she goes, you need to. Well, she made her first go around the back. She wouldn't let her cross in front of me again. She's like, you need to apologize to her for stepping over her feet like that. And I was like, wow, good momming. Good for you. Anyway, so that was lovely. Uh, okay. So anyway, once the line started moving, it was super long, but it was pretty good. Uh, so the first author I wanted to make sure to see was, of course, Maureen Johnson. And it was amazing. Uh, I had her sign her latest book. Um, that's actually not the book I would have chosen her to sign, chosen for her to sign. But Abigail has the majority of my Maureen Johnson books right now, which is fine. I wanted her to read them, and I'm happy if she's enjoying them. So, anyway. Uh, most importantly, though, I, you know, wanted to thank her uh, for her and Dan for the Sesu podcast and how it really is a lifesaver. And so then she kind of looked around and, like, tapped her nose. And then, <laughs> this isn't going to make any sense <laughs> unless you listen to their pod, but started singing Amy Carter's Shoes. Joe Biden campaign song. Um, and yeah, I can't explain it, but it's fucking hilarious. And she said it was the very first live performance. And oh my God, I just felt, I felt blessed and loved. <laughs> <laughs> and I lost my shit. I yeah, was fangirling so hard. Yeah, you were, you were laugh crying. <laughs> you were so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I was like covering up my mouth and I was like, oh shit, I'm not supposed to be touching my face. Uh, <laughs> but so then we went to go see the other author I really wanted to see. Um, so one of the most prolific ghost writers in the Babysitter's Club series, Peter Lorraine, just y'all. So I brought with me uh, BSC 100, Christie's Worst Idea, uh, obviously one of the ones he did so Jess gets up to him and she says I hope this is okay and yeah, he I looks hope this at is her cool. I'm very he's like, old he's like oh no of course and he doesn't realize what she's talking about I yeah. think he thinks that you're talking about because you're not a teenager oh maybe so asking yeah because I said and, and I'm very old looks, and he goes I'm even older yeah. <laughs> and then he looks down at the book and then just starts laughing yeah he <laughs> loved it and it was like amazing he was so delighted and but yeah i was a little bit worried you know because he's got like his own books he's been Uh writing all his shit for a really long time um but you know i thought he might be embarrassed of his babysitter's club days or something (laughs) and but i looked on his wikipedia and he had they're listed there so i assume like he would have that scrubbed if like Mm -hmm. he was like really 
in a mirror. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. I was proud of myself for doing it, honestly. Um, so anyways, he, then he goes, um, you know, who was an intern for me? Well, by now, at this point of Christie's worst idea, uh, is an editor of this. And I'm like, yeah, he's no? like, and, and you know who was the editor of that book? Uh-huh. It was this 18 year old kid just yeah. starting out in the. Yeah. In well, his... intern then. Yeah. Then. Yeah. Uh, and he points to the guy at the table with him, uh, who happens to be uh, David Levithan, who I also love. He co wrote <laughs> with John Green, Will Grayson, Will Grayson, which is one of my favorite, like, modern, you know, this time period uh, YA books. Um, so, yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they kind of like geeked out over their time at the babysitter's club. And I was just losing my <laughs> goddamn mind, y'all. Um, so Peter signed the book, uh, Thanks for the Blast from the Past. And he got David to sign it, too. And he signed it and his editor. <laughs> um yeah. Oh my God. I was just flipping out. Yeah, and was it, was, it was amazing. Um, yeah. When we were leaving, um, you said that like I seemed more excited or thrilled or something than I did to Harry <laughs> Potter world. Yeah. Just the drive across <laughs> town and going uh-huh. in and meeting some authors and listening to some panels uh-huh. was some a better time time than, than going to Harry Potter and world. So much cheaper. And so much cheaper. We had to pay ten dollars for parking and then food, I think. Yeah. And I, think I bought was, I bought the Yeah, with the graphic book, novel. With the book, the food and the parking. It was Which like was only eleven dollars itself, by yeah. the way. So how much all together? It was like forty five dollars total. Yeah. And it was the best. <laughs> <laughs> now, we may have contracted coronavirus, uh, but I don't know, I got a sore throat, so We'll know in a few days. We'll know in a few days. It's okay, though, because (laughs) yesterday after uh, just a regular uh, med refill doctor's appointment for me, we went to Walmart and stocked up as best we could in case we have to be quarantined. But we couldn't get much. Absolutely. Most of the stuff we were looking for was completely out. Mm -hmm. There was nothing. But we got... Some canned food and some frozen mm-hmm. pizzas, and enough to survive. And so two much weeks rice. <laughs> well, now we have <laughs> so much. Rice. We have fifteen pounds of be- of rice, which is basically a week and a half worth of calories for two people, if needed. Yeah. And hey, hey, rice, if stored with all <laughs> of the air taken out, can last twenty five to thirty years. He's learned so much about rice. Y'all. So next time there's not a pandemic about the outbreak maybe get some mm-hmm. rice when it's you know i would i would not um recommend going and buying out all the rice today because no you know what people are going to keep bringing groceries to your grocery store uh there's not going to be an issue with that right now but next well, time next time there's an abundance of it at your store right. i would say mm-hmm. get some and put it aside get you some vacuum airbags put it in there <laughs> Put it up in your attic, so, you mm-hmm. know, a cool, dry place, and it'll last for 25 to 30 years. Yeah. So, we're prepared if we have to do a self-quarantine, but, you know, we didn't uh, go out and take a bunch of stuff from people who might need it more than us. Yeah, we did. I mean, we... I mean, we couldn't, you know. Um, medical-wise. There was no hand soap. Obviously, no hand sanitizer. There was no cleaning supplies. But I saw people in the store that had like four packs of, um, uh, you know, four large packs of uh, paper towels, mm-hmm. um, like six yeah. things of laundry detergent. Toilet paper is getting really, really hit right now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's they're gonna deliver more toilet paper, people. Yeah, they've got. But if they can't get out, if they paper. can't get out to get it. Right. So have you, two weeks worth. Don't have yeah, don't have yeah. four months worth. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But you know, people are freaking out, and you, yeah, don't panic. Stay yes. vigilant. Constant vigilance, as Mad Eye Moody would say. But don't panic, as our yes. Would. L- listen to the scientists right now are saying you, we need to be careful so that it doesn't get out of control. Right. 
but it's no need for panic. Right. Just be safe. Wash your hands. Wash your fucking Don't hands. We're going to say and, that and, again. And you know We're going to turn this into a whole other <laughs> thing again. We did this last week. I know that most people wash their hands when do they go you? to the bathroom. I, I know that there are a lot of people that do it on at, you know, when they get done using the bathroom, things like that. Mm -hmm. But you don't realize until something like this, how many times you touch surfaces. And then and, your face. <laughs> and then really you should wash your hands. After, I, I've walked upstairs. I, I've walked upstairs at work uh, three, four times a day, touching the rails mm -hmm. and then not even think about it. Until mm -hmm. this, and then I'm now like, how many people just touched that rail? Mm -hmm. And now I've been touching my keyboard, and yeah. you didn't take with you one of the two bottles of Lysol we yeah, were I able to, to find at Lowe's. Yeah. That's a place, y'all, that a lot of people don't think about getting cleaning supplies. Oh, there's they also have them. there was they another didn't have a place. Ton, there was but... another place was uh, Staples because they do oh, yeah. they do stuff for offices like uh, bathroom for yeah. the offices, so they have. Some yeah. Purell and stuff like that for. Um, well, I bet they don't have that now. But well, yeah, they but might you could have. Some you might could uh, order it or... online as well because there's a lot mm -hmm. of places that are just completely out online. Yeah. Anyway, stay safe, y'all. What stay are you safe. reading? Um. So I'm actually not reading anything at the moment because I just finished the book mm -hmm. after you got home today. Yeah, I had like three minutes left when I got home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um I hate when you're <laughs> when you pull up in the driveway and you're playing it really loud cuz it just sounds like somebody's outside our door talking. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck is going on? I'm like, oh, he's just home. <laughs> so I finished Hollow Kingdom uh, by Kira Jane Buxton. That was the one with the crow as the mm. main protagonist. It was very good. I uh, hope they have more. Um the one I just finished is called The Book of Science and Antiquities by Thomas Keneally. Keneally? Keneally? <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway, he's the author of Schindler's List. And um, this one was okay. Um, yeah. It got kind of boring at times. And then for like the last half of the book, you knew he had cancer. And so it became kind of a... A little bit downer and anyway. Oh, fun to read in conjunction with the famine book. <laughs> but it, it it basically kind of follows a filmmaker who uh, was part of uh, filming of the, the this skeleton that was uh, discovered in Australia uh, that was like 40, between 40 and 42,000 years old. Mm. And it was ritualistically buried. Um, so that was the first, they called him the learned man, hmm. um, because obviously there was thought and communication needed uh -huh. to uh -huh. have his burial in the way they did. So that was the first indication of a communicating, uh, human homo sapien. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it's the oldest that they, they found. I don't know if that's still true yeah. as of the time they wrote this book i believe it was but anyway it goes back and forth between the 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 filmmaker and the and the forty two thousand mm -hmm. year old person and mm -hmm. um so that that makes it a little interesting but i i don't yeah i don't know if i'd recommend it. it's got 2.92 stars on goodreads mm -hmm. i gave it a three mm -hmm. uh i think it was mm -hmm. worth a listen for yeah but anyway yeah i'm still not reading anything and then I've got one that I guess I'll start to read, which is The Girl in Red by Christina Henry. Know nothing about it right now. Cool. I'll tell you about it next week. All right. Well, I hope uh, some of the books we learned about uh, this past weekend will get me back into a reading kick. Uh, so next week. <laughs> There is an audiobook. That's why we're doing this one um, at the library. Uh, we're going to do Angels Watching Over Me by Lurleen McDaniel. And it's going to piss you off. Why would you do that? Because <laughs> there's an audiobook of it. A readily available audiobook. Uh, and it is one I read uh, many times because I did find it fascinating. Mm -hmm. 
Anyway, we're rereading the books of your childhood. So you don't have to. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.